Okay, as we start, let's start with questions. I promise that yesterday I got to keep my word. Do you have questions from uh, what we have talked so far? Okay. Was the res was the raising of the dead of that young um, that young uh, disabled person was that documented in newspapers? Um, honestly, I don't know. I do know that the little town. Everybody knew and everybody talked, but there is something very strange with human being. When we acknowledge God's work, we have to change. And if we don't like to change, soon enough we find an explanation for anything. Because people were amazed, people came, 44 got baptized, but about two months later, you would talk to them and they said, oh, maybe he was not dead, maybe he was just in coma, maybe people would look, people who like the way they live, they always find an explanation. And they can explain it away, quite anything. But I, uh, I don't remember about the newspaper, I just know that anybody, I would go to the store, it was a crisis, you would not find anything. You would go to buy whatever and the stores were empty. Literally, you would go to buy potatoes, there was no potatoes or milk or whatever, and there were long lines, and you would ask people, why are you waiting for? Well, we know that they will receive something, but we don't know what. And people would wait in lines, two, three, four hours, and okay, they got eggs. So you would wait, and you would get a dozen of eggs per person. So then you would have to take your wife and your kids, so you can get more eggs, so they would last longer. Well. I would go to the line. Okay, they got vegetable oil, uh, olive oil. Wait in the line. And the, and the cashier would say, Mr. Goya, you come forward. I want to give you oil first so you may pray for me too. They, the whole town talked about it. It's just not too many people choose to change. Israel saw the Red Sea split and 40 days later they made a golden calf. That's the way we are. We forget what God has done, and then we go back to normal life. Any other question? I cannot see you well because of the lights, but just push, insist, get, okay, there is a hand there. Thank you. <laughs> wait, David, wait. Ho hold on a second. Let no. them give you the mic so anybody could hear the question. I've had this question a few days. I think the first day you inferred you prayed for somebody and they're going to be saved. But I bet Jesus prayed for Judas and he wasn't saved. Did I misunderstand you or quantify that statement? Please repeat. I'm not sure I got the question, if you don't mind. Well, the question is, if you necessarily pray for a person, that doesn't mean to say they're going to give their heart to the Lord. I thought you inferred well, one of the first talks that they will. But I reckon God doesn't take away their uh, independence. God doesn't. God doesn't force people. We have a choice for sure. And, and there are, uh, we don't have time to go through everything, but there are four stages of spiritual maturity. And people usually, wonderful, people usually in the first stage feel very good. When you get to know Christ, things work amazing. You pray and things happen. And people want to go back to the first stage because then you go to the second stage. It's a crisis. God doesn't answer the way you used. So basically, people give up on God and they want to control God instead of being controlled. But second stage, you learn to be controlled by God and give up self and so on. When you get to the last stage, like Moses, like Paul, basically people sacrifice their life for God and consider it a privilege. And very few get there because any change, we consider it a crisis and we go back wherever we are comfortable. But we do have a choice and God respects that choice. Nevertheless, he keeps working with us. And I could give you examples, powerful examples. Anyway, do you have questions related to more to prayer? Because I am I, I'm not, uh, I don't know to answer every question. I'm not an expert in every area, not even in prayer. So... More what about prayer, yes. My, my question is, what's the role of fasting in prayer? The role of fasting in prayer. That's a good question. 
I did not study about fasting because I don't like fasting. I eat, I eat like 10 times a day and I am still hungry. My wife does fast, but I don't. Now, I do believe fasting is good. I know very little about fasting, but I'm going to tell you what I know. Fasting is not hunger strike to manipulate God. Fasting is clearing your mind to hear God's voice. And you don't clear your mind just by going without food. You can clear your mind by not watching TV for two days or not listening to all type of music or not eating unhealthy foods. Basically, you give up something to make room for something else because we are so busy with so many things that our mind never stops. For instance, in the Bible it says, Be still and know that I am God. Well, when he says be still, is not what we think. And no is not what we think. The words in Hebrew are yada and rafa. Be still and no. Rafa doesn't mean to be still, to be quiet. Rafa means calm down. Don't be anxious. Relax. When you come into God's presence, don't try to solve the whole world. This and that and that and that, 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 that. Everything to tell him everything. He knows. Calm down. Enjoy his presence. Contemplate. Reflect. See who he is. Get to know him. He's going to help you more than to say everything. In fact, the Bible has some very harsh words about people who say a lot in prayer. It says that they bring the sacrifice of the fools, comma, that are many words. That's in the Bible. That's not me. Sacrifice of the fools, comma, many words. Don't say a lot. Be still means calm down. Don't be anxious. Relax in God's presence. And yada, and know that I am God. Doesn't mean to know that he is God. Yada is what God used as a word, as a term, to tell Adam after he made Eve. He said, yada. And that means go and know her, sleep with her. Have intimate relationship with her. Basically, God says, calm down and have a relationship with me. Prayer is not to solve problems as we think. Prayer is to know God. And when you know him, problems are taken care of. God doesn't UPS. God doesn't FedEx blessings. God doesn't ship his blessings. God brings them along. You are better off to get God because when he comes, he takes care of everything else. But we don't get the very simple verse. Seek first and the other things will be provided. We want to seek the other things. So basically, going back to the very simple question, fasting, all the other things are not to solve a problem, are to get time and focus as much as possible to know God. Did I answer a little? Now, I don't know about fasting. I never fast. When I fast two hours, that's enough fasting for me. <laughs> there was another question here. Yesterday, I think you mentioned about the, I think it was eight types of prayer. Eight types of prayer. Are you going to no. elaborate on the eight? Or can you tell us at least what the eight are so I can go No, but I out. give you something else. Oh. So I'm not, I, I, I'm kind, okay? So we don't have time. It doesn't help to tell you, Prayer of thankfulness, prayer of intercession, prayer of... It doesn't help. I have to elaborate. I have to spend time. It takes 10 to 12 hours. But this is what I do for you. And you'll be very happy. <laughs> I'm going... I'm willing to give the conference my materials. Amen. Okay. And if they would put them on the web page of the conference, you can go there and download them. Now I tell you the bad news. It's not going to help you. Why? Because it's outline form, bullet point. Ten, 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 ten. You need the explanation for every point. The PowerPoint is not going to help you a lot. Now the good news is that I do have recordings where I gave the whole prayer seminar. And I am willing to send the conference a copy the CDs, all 12 hours of prayer seminar. So if you watch the PowerPoint and listen the presentation, you'll get the explanation for every point, and that's going to help you. Is that good? 
Okay? <laughs> now, I do have conditions. I don't want you to take credit for it or to alter it. Or You follow me? I think that's just fair. Okay, any other question? Coming. Um, your thought on intercessory prayer as far as uh, do our prayers give God access um, okay. to people's lives? Okay, thank you. There are two types of prayer out of the eight that you can pray without ceasing. The others you can connect without ceasing, but not ask without ceasing. You follow me? Usually we pray the prayer of consumerism. That means... Give me, bless me, forgive me, help me, heal me, 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 me. When you get to contemplate God, listen carefully. Even fighting sin doesn't help you. You may not agree. I don't care. You don't have to invite me back. That's okay. But I want you to think about it. I was a kid. And I had, I was crazy. Hopeless. For instance, I would catch our dog and catch the fleas from our dog. And then put them in the tub where you take a shower in, in the bathtub, and watch the fleas trying to escape. Bang, bang. They would jump, but they were unable to jump so high. So they would drop back in the tub. And after a while, they would get tired and give up and die. And one time... When I got older, I told my dad, I said, listen, I am trying to be patient, but I have a fast temper. I have short fuse. I get angry. I explode in a second. And I have been praying. And the more I pray, the more angry I am. Did it ever happen to you? You pray and then you do it even more? And my father said to me, you remember when you would catch the fleas from the dog and put them in the tub? Didn't they try to escape? Yes. Did they manage? No. What happened? They died. Well, that's your fight with Satan. You are going to give up and die or become a Pharisee and live a double life. And my father said, you don't have the power to fight Satan, but you do have the power to connect with Jesus. Jesus and Satan don't share the same room ever. When Jesus comes in, Satan goes out. Therefore, Ellen White says, at the foot of the cross, reading the Sire of Ages, contemplating his love, his sacrifice, his perfection, who he is. Listen carefully now. Without human effort, we are changed into his image. Basically, you are not changed fighting Satan. You are changed spending time with Christ. That's the reason he gave us Sabbath. He says, I gave them my Sabbath to be a sign between them and me, so they may know that I am their God who sanctifies them. You remember? Well, the Hebrew doesn't say so. I love translating from Hebrew. You go to the original, he says, I gave them my Sabbath, and this would be the sign between them and me. And then quotation marks. Uh, not quotation, how you say in English? Whatever, two points. Color. Thank you. English. Oh. Anyway, and this would be the sign, Colin. And then he says, instead of saying, give them my Sabbath, and this they will know that I am their God who sanctifies them, he says, this will be the sign. They will know me, and by knowing me, they will be sanctified. So basically, people who don't keep Sabbath can never be holy. And if you think that you don't work and that's the way you keep Sabbath, let me tell you, lazy people never work, so they sanctify every day. <laughs> you don't sanctify Sabbath by not working. You sanctify Sabbath by having a connection with God. So if you didn't have a connection with God, even if you didn't work, you broke Sabbath. Do you follow me? By having a connection with God, just being in his presence, you become holy. There is no human effort. You don't even realize. You behold and you are changed from glory to glory. Okay. Uh, so, eight types of prayer. Intercessory prayer. We didn't get there. I'm just, oh man, I go around and around before I give the answer. Hold on a second. Intercessory prayer. When you pray prayer of consumerism, you never change. You never get it. Because we are not called to put our eyes on sin 
but on Jesus. We are not called to put our eyes on problems, but we are called to put our eyes on promises. You follow me? Therefore, you present your problem, not because he doesn't know, but because you give him permission to work, and then you say, may you will be done, and you move on. However, when you pray intercessory prayer, reflective prayer, beholding prayer, an intercessory prayer, there are the two prayers that you can pray all the time. When you pray intercessory prayer, why should you continue to pray? It gives God opportunity to work daily, number one. Number two, God may have something for you to do, but we never hear his voice because we are too busy. When you keep praying, slowly you tune your mind to God's voice, eventually that you may hear what he wants you to do, and you may be ready to do it even if you don't understand. He may enable you to do what is your part to do about saving that person. Did I answer? Hopefully. Okay, there was another hand there. I, I suggest that we take the last question. Okay. And then we'll, uh, because we are keen to hear the new presentation. Okay. okay, last question. Elder, every time you quote a verse, you change it. When are you going to make a translation of your own so that we get what the Hebrew actually said? <laughs> <laughs> there are Bibles, very few, like Webster, like others, that actually give you all the possible translations. It gives what they think is the translation and then parentheses the other ways to translate. And when we go to the Lord's Prayer, I'm going to give you examples. For instance, it says in, in Genesis when Cain killed his brother Abel and God met him and said, sin is at the door, but you must master it. You must. You remember? It doesn't say so in Hebrew. It says there is a sacrifice for sin outside the gate if you not control it. Basically, God didn't tell Cain, you got to fight sin and win. God said, there will be a sacrifice if you sin. Come back. It's totally different. My, my question leading from that was, are you, some of us have prayed for 60, 70 years and the prayers have done fairly well. Is the purpose of this program here to teach us how to pray or to enrich our prayer life? I don't believe that we can teach somebody to pray. Prayer is like swimming. You never pray learning about prayer. You pray praying. I don't think that I can teach. I think I can help people understand a little more. But unless we pray, we'll never learn to pray. Because if somebody doesn't hear this seminar, they still can pray and God answers because God is so good. He would come to whatever we understand and get us from there. And as you pray and study, God is going to discover to you what you need. So basically, if you pray, that's better than anything else. If you learn about prayer but don't pray, not going to help. Okay, this was the last one. Let's start. Let's have a prayer and then start. Father, again, we acknowledge that there is nothing we can say or do unless your spirit would work. So we please pray that you come with your spirit and you touch us all for your honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we said yesterday, give us today our daily bread. Now listen carefully. We have the habit to ask God to do what he asked us to do. God made the gospel be preached. God asked you to preach the gospel. Oh, be with the poor and the soldiers. God asked you to be with the poor. You follow me? It's easy to just throw it back to God. I remember when I was, we, we have a good habit. Very first check when I get my salary goes to tithe. The next one goes to offerings and poor. I set it aside and then pay it. I don't keep it in the house and then pay the bills and whatever is left over, very little, that's to live the whole month. And I learned the principle that I call the chewing gum principle. What is that? You can chew it forever. It never ends. If I, if I am faithful and pay tithe and poor and offerings and my bills, God makes the little leftover like chewing gum. It always helps me to whatever I need. And I never have a lot, but I never have less. We consider ourselves very blessed. So... This is what happened. Learning that I cannot afford to say, 
I am poor, I cannot pay tithe. I am poor, I cannot help the poor. I am poor. In fact, you don't have to be rich or poor. You just have to give from whatever God gave you. So what I did, my wife and I made a decision that we'll pay more than tithe, that we'll give so much percentage, clear percentage to offerings, plus if there is a special need, we will pray and see how God inspires us, and then we'll give a percentage for the poor. And we set that aside every month. What happened? I remember there was a month, I paid my tithe, I put the money for the poor, put the money for this, that, paid the bills, and we had just a little left over. And I took the money that were for tuition for our youngest kid, his name is Ovidio. I took the money to go and pay tuition because I don't want to keep them, so I don't want to be tempted to spend them. So I took the money, got in the van, nice car, Toyota Sienna. You go online and you check it. Really high, top line, top of the line, whatever, all the whistles and bells. Very proud of it. I, took, I got in the car. It was pouring, raining, crazy rain, heavy rain. And I get in the car and I drive around the block and around the block and around the block four times and I get to the school. When I get to our school, right before entering the school property, there is a young lady there crying in the rain. And I recognize her because I baptized her two, three months before. So I stop the car, open the door and say, hey, so and so, why are you crying? And she said, well, I cannot tell you. I said, come on, maybe I can help. No, I am ashamed to tell you. Come on, tell me. And, and she says, well, uh, pastor, uh, they closed the business and we got fired and I have no money. And she had two small babies, two children. And she said, <coughs> I got fired and I didn't pay rent and they evicted me from my apartment and I didn't pay electricity and I didn't pay telephone and I didn't pay this and that. And we ate all the leftover food <coughs> And I had four potatoes. And I went to the neighbor to put them in the oven and I cooked them and I'm going home. And after eating these potatoes, I don't know what is next. So God impressed me to get my hand into my pocket, get the tuition money and help her. But my mind said, this is tuition. You got to pay the school. But then my other side of the brain said, you got to help the poor. What do you do next? So, uh, sell, sell your car. Come on, leave me alone with my car. My car and my motorcycles, they are holy. They cannot be touched. <coughs> I'm just kidding. Okay, so my hand was stuck, was like paralyzed. So I had to put it into my pocket because it would not obey me. So I told her, get in the van. She got in the van. We drove to Aldi. You know Aldi, don't you? It's a cheap store. Okay. We went to Aldi and I, I took a gallon of milk and I looked to her and she was... Mm. So I took a second gallon and she smiled. I said, okay, that's good. Put it in the cart. Took a dozen of eggs. She looked to her face. Mm. Took two dozens of eggs. She said, whoa. Put it in the cart. And until the whole cart was packed with groceries. And then I paid for it. And I said, is that enough food? She said, this is going to last us two weeks. I said, praise the Lord. And then... I called the landlord, the lady who owned 500 apartments in that city, very well-to-do, very rich. I called her and I said, listen, I want you to forgive what she owes you. You cannot kick her in the street in the fall, in the rain. She has two babies. Let her be. She'll find a job and she's going to pay. Oh, she owes me so much. I'm not going to let her back in. She has to pay. I said, okay, this is how much I have left over. But that's just half. I'm going to sacrifice and pay half, and you sacrifice and forgive the other half. No, I cannot do that. I said, yes, you can. No, I cannot. I said, yes, you just don't want to. I said, listen, are you a Christian? Yes, I am a so-and-so. And she told me what denomination. I said, hey, I know you're a pastor. I'm going to call him and tell him what a Christian you are. Oh, I don't care. I said, yes, you do. And I mean, you don't know me. I'm crazy. I am going to call him. And I said, I will not stop. I'm going to call the newspaper and put an article in the newspaper about you. You don't do that. I said, you don't know me. Just trust me when I say something. Really, I follow up. Well, why would I forgive her? I said, 
are you a Christian? She said, yes. I said, no, you are not. You just like to believe you are a Christian. Are you telling your kids to follow Jesus? Yes. Well, they will never follow Jesus. They will go in the world and take drugs. Why would you say that? Because you don't give them an example. Kids are like monkeys. They do what they see. They don't do what they hear. Here. So I said, you can teach them, but when Christ comes, he will say, I was poor, I was, and you, you ignored me. So go away. And I said, you are not a Christian. Basically, you don't have a heart. You are worse than the world, than the pagans. She kept quiet for a second, and she said, well, I'm willing to forgive half. I said, well, you started to repent. Good for you. And then she said, but I'm not going to do it next month. I said, I didn't ask you to do it forever. Deal. She forgave half. I paid half. I took the telephone, called my elders. I said, hey, what do we have next Sabbath? Communion. Okay. I want to tell you, we will not have communion and you will not have a sermon unless you put together money and pay her electricity and her telephone. I did that with my money. You got to do the same. If not, you will not see me again. Pastor, you got to come. You are our pastor. I said, hey, you don't like all the conference. I just moved there. I was new. They would not call the conference on me. They were first in the honeymoon. So they said, okay, we'll do it. They got money together. They paid. She was so happy. She started to hug me and to cry, and she would not stop. She made my day. And then I told her, I said, listen, I want you to get a job. I don't care what job. The poorest, the worst job. Go to Walmart. Get a job. Don't wait until you get a good job. Just get any job, and then look for a better job. Next month, will not help you again. But I want you to come back to me next month and give me a name of somebody who has worse than you that you helped. I don't care if you don't have money. You tell me, I gave them 10 bucks. I gave them, I helped somebody poor. I want you to do that. And she did. She got a job and she came next month and she told me she helped somebody. You cannot say, Lord, be with the poor. You can say, Lord, I'm going to help you be with me. You follow me? You don't say, give me today. You say, give us. And it's a reversible in Greek. Basically, it means God gives you as you give others or in order to give others. When I was in Andrews, when we moved from Romania, I remember we had nothing. Zero. Zero is not something. Zero is zero. We had no food. We had no money. We had no insurance. We had no rights. I didn't know English. I would speak with my hands until I would get tired because I didn't have too many. I knew about 15 words in English, so I had to play with those words, whatever, crazy. Anyway, so we didn't have a car. I would have to walk to school. And there was an old man who would bring canned food. And it was snow, winter. I would walk there, stay in the snow, wait until he would come and give canned food to the poor. And I would take cans and then go home and finish them in two days and then go a whole rest of the week without food. We didn't eat for five days until next week when the old man would come again. And I remember one time we got to the point that we got very depressed. And we prayed and we said, Lord, Give us food. And God will not answer. And we said, Lord, take care of us. And God will not answer. So what we did, I told my wife, listen, we focus too much on self. Let's focus on God. So he said, Lord, do you have something for us to do that would be a blessing for others? And instead of saying, take care of us, you would help us take care of others? After I prayed that prayer, somebody knocked in the door. I open the door, and the man says, are you a name that I don't even remember? Yokoshira or something? I don't know. It's a strange name. I cannot even say it. I said, nope. My name is Pavel, last name Goya. He says, when did you move here? I said, just about two months ago. Oh, he lived here before you. I said, yeah. Probably he graduated and moved. He said, well, his wife used to fix our clothing she was a tailor. She would do sewing. And he said, well, I have a jacket that is broken here. I guess I have to find somebody. I said, no, you don't have to find somebody else. My wife knows how to fix it. Okay, take it. He said, how much? I said, whatever. He gave us 20 bucks. That was a lot of money for somebody hungry. And then he says, and we have a big farm, and God blessed us, and I have my trunk full of vegetables. Can you use them? Duh. I said, bring it on. He unloaded his trunk, filled our little living room, 
as soon as we saw there about eight boxes of food, and it was not just vegetables, tomato and cucumber, some peppers and eggplants, but it was sugar and bread and oil. We felt like heaven on earth. And Dana and I said, honey, you know what? When we prayed, we said, Lord, help us be a blessing. Let's see if there are others that don't have food. So we visited students in Andrews, and we found seven other families that really had a lot worse. One of them, I remember, classmate in the seminary, his parents got killed in Africa in a car accident, and he had six other younger brothers and sisters alone at home, and he had no money. So what we did, we took a box to every one of those families, and we kept just one box for ourselves. And that man came the whole winter, every Monday, and brought a trunk of food. When he came next Monday, he said, uh, can you use more food? I said, yeah. He said, what happened to the rest of the food? I gave you a lot. And I told him, I shared. He said, good for you. I'm going to keep giving you so you can share. So listen, we are not called to focus too much on what I need. God called us to be a blessing. Give us today our daily bread. We should basically not focus on give me, but on us, all of us. And it is okay for yourself too, as long as you are a blessing for others. You follow me? In fact, we don't even know how to give up. For instance, we had a van before we had a Toyota Sienna. That's a nice car. We had a Dodge Grand Caravan. Do you know Dodge or Chrysler? Yeah? Who has a, a Dodge Caravan? If you have one, I will pray for you. <laughs> when you say Dodge, you say bad transmission. It's a nice engine, a nice car, luxury car, bad transmission. We had a Dodge Grand Caravan. I got it in auction. Man, it had TV and VCR and video games and all the whistles and bells and lights and funny, no, no, no. But the transmission broke. So I had to pay 550 to go to the junkyard because a new transmission was 2,200. Crazy. So I went to the junkyard, purchased a second-hand transmission, paid 550, paid another 450 to a church member who was a mechanic to install the transmission, and then it worked again. Guess what? Three months later, we were in vacation in Washington, D.C., and as we drive home, it goes, uh, 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 and it would not switch from second to third and from third to fourth. It got stuck in the second gear. And man, to drive from Washington to Wisconsin in the second gear, you get retired before you get home. So basically, I prayed and had faith and nothing happened. So I anointed, I asked for resurrection of the car, nothing happened. So I got angry and started to kick the wheels and go around the car and nothing happened. I turned it off and on and nothing happened. Ah, I drove home and everybody would show me nice signs. They would curse me, get off the road! And you chew, and, uh, when I got home, I hated Dodge. So I went to the junkyard Paid another 500, got another second-hand transmission, paid another 450, installed it, and I put it for sale. Let somebody else have it. It's like everybody knew. Nobody called. And I dropped the price and put it on the internet, Craigslist, uh, cable TV, newspaper, put a big sign in the windshield. Nobody called. Man, I just prayed, and I asked God to help me sell the van. Nobody called. I said, you know what? I drive it until it breaks, and then I junk it, forget it. I never buy a Dodge for the rest of my life. And here I am, driving to one of my churches. We have prayer meeting, and I tell them, do not ask God to do what God asked you to do. You would offend God. Basically, ask him to give you the power to do it. And I tell them, we focus too much on us and our needs instead of focusing on God and others. And that's the reason we are so miserable. And after I tell them, I get in the van, drive home, and I am praying, Lord, help me sell the van, help me sell the van. And it came to me, you don't leave what you preach. They said, Lord, forgive me. 
I'm going to give up the van. I'm not going to focus on myself. You can have it. And God said, really? I said, well, how much do you pay for it? <laughs> and God said, well, do you give it to me or you want to sell it to me? And I had in my mind the conversation with the Lord. And I said, Lord, this is not Mercedes. This is a junk. You can have it. But you need to pay me something because I need to buy a car. And the Lord said, do you trust me? Yes. Then give it to me. Lord, I do trust you, but I cannot give it to you just to give it to you. I, I got to sell it. And the Lord did not talk to me again. So I said, okay. This is hard. But I'm going to give it to you. Do whatever you want. And if you give me a car, great. If not, whatever. As soon as I gave it up. And I was willing to, I said, Lord, do whatever you want. You want to give me something, fine. If not, you can have it for free. Take it. As soon, and believe me, sometimes it's even hard to say the words. As soon as I said amen, I got a phone call. One of my church members, in fact, the lady that I told you, the fat lady, okay, she called me. She says, Pastor, do you still have that van? I said, yeah, why? I want to buy it from you. I said, nah, you don't want to buy that car. Why? Well, if you buy the van from me, you'll never come to church. You'll curse me when you see me. Let a stranger buy it. <laughs> and she says, Pastor, you are wrong. If it's so bad, you should not say it to anybody. She was right. And then she says, you forget. My brother fixed it for you. I know it has a bad transmission. Why do you think I call you? If I had the money, I would call the dealer. I don't have the money. Then what do you want? You want the van for free? Well, you asked 4,500 and all I have, I have 1,500. Would you take 1,500 for the van? I said, well, I just pray that I give it to God for whatever he chooses or for free. You can have it. Really? I can have it for 1,500? And I said, well, tell me, why do you want the van? And she says, well, I listened to your prayer seminar and I decided to serve God. And I don't know what to do, but I enjoy driving. And there are people who come to evangelism, children who come to our school, people who come to church, and they are poor, they don't have transportation. And I need a van to be able to transport them to the church. So basically, I know that your van is broken, and I know that you cannot ask too much. And I don't have money, so I called you. I said, well, you can have it for whatever you can give me. She gave me 1500 Now, this is the bad part of the story. Ten years later, she's still driving the junk he never broke. <laughs> Basically, I think you got the point. Yeah, that's funny, I know. You got the point. We like to ask and to ask and to get, but we don't like to actually do what God told us to do. Prayer church, everything we do from morning to night, it's all about me. Jesus, nothing about self. It was all about God, all about others. God is calling us to think a little different. You follow me? Well, we do have a little more time, so we could go a little more into the prayer. And forgive our debt as we forgive our debtors. This is a big one. This is one of the biggest in the whole prayer that people never get it and if they did, they would be happy Christians. But they don't enjoy happiness, salvation because they don't understand this one. I remember in my ver very first district in America, not my first district in ministry, but my first district in America, I got to a church where a lady who was 92 years old Sharp like a fox. Smart and evil. <laughs> Filthy rich, a millionaire, multi-millionaire. But I do have other rich people in the church and they are kind and humble and polite. I love them. But this lady, Satan didn't need to tempt her. She could teach Satan. Bad. She was even kids, even pets would run from her. She was bad. This lady came to me, and he came close that I could feel her breath, and she didn't wash her teeth. She came close into my mouth, and she says face to face like that, nose in nose, 
you, if you don't do what I tell you, I'm going to move you in no time from here. She did that. She moved 17 pastors before me within two years or less. Praise the Lord for good administration. The conference president was just elected. And you'll, you'll hear the story in a second. So basically, we will go to a board meeting and everybody will look to her. And if she did that, they would vote yes. If she did that, they would vote no. She was the alpha cow. All the other cows <laughs> would follow her. So I told them, hey, we got to do some evangelism. And she said, and they said, no, why not? It is Jesus' command to preach the gospel. And she would say, and they would say, why not? Well, uh, ask her. No spine, jellyfish. Anyway, so <clears throat> one time we talked about building a church in India. And the Madison Church from Wisconsin, big church, rich church, 500 people, gave $2,000. Milwaukee Church, big church, rich church, 600 people, gave 2000 Green Bay Church, six, 700 people, gave 2000 And my church, people, 40. And she says, how much money do we have in savings? And the treasurer says, 67000 Give it all. And the board says, uh, 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 listen, uh, shouldn't we give like the others 2000 or 4 or 5 or 10? But we need to fix the roof and we need to fix the water heater. Shouldn't we keep a little for our needs? Are you arguing with me? And the guy put his head down, no, no. And I said, folks, what is wrong with you? And she looks to me, young man, you want to be moved? I said, maybe it's better for me to move, actually. I said, oh, I can help you there. <laughs> and so I told him, I said, listen, folks, you pray. And you do what God tells you to do. If not, then you don't need a church here. Because this is not God's church. This is her church. Oh, she got angry with me. <laughs> like the dragon. <laughs> <laughs> and so I told her, I said, I want you to leave this board and not come back before you repent. And she did. She got up. She slammed the door. And she said, you are terminated. She was the terminator. <laughs> and <laughs> she left. And then she called the conference and said, how much do you owe for the dorms at the academy? And the president said, well, 2.4 million. She said, OK, I'm writing a check of 2.4 million on the condition that you either fire or move this pastor. <laughs> That's a big offer on my head. <laughs> And, and the president said, listen, so-and-so, I would love to receive that donation, but we cannot do what you say just because you pay. We will not move him. You need to find a way to work with your pastor. Praise the Lord. Yes. Well, she got angry and she said, I'll never give you a donation as long as you are a president. Bang. And then she called people in the church, all her friends. Hey, don't give any money. Don't go back. Let's move this pastor. Hey, don't give any money. And she called and she divided the church. The other half called me. Pastor, what should I do? Be on her side or your side? I said, listen, folks. There are no sides in this church. It doesn't really matter who is right and who is wrong. When the church is divided, Satan wins regardless who wins. And I said, we are not called to fight. We are called to preach the gospel. So I don't want you to get involved in any type of fight. I want you to visit. I want you to pray. I want you to do evangelism. I want you to do Bible studies. I want you to study. I want you to keep going to church. I want you to do what you are called to do. Ignore the fight. It was hard on me, but I chose to ignore the fight. And she was fighting against me, but it takes two to fight. She had no another one, so she was fighting alone, whatever. Now... I would have to pray for her, and that was not easy. I would pray for her and not even say her name because I hated her so much. I would say, Lord, help this lady because she is so evil. And I had a hard time to even pronounce her name. It's easy to tell the story, but if you were me, she made my life very difficult. 
So we kept praying, my wife and I, that God would give us wisdom and strength to help that church. And we prayed for three months. You know what happened after three months? And my wife fasted every Wednesday. I didn't. I just prayed. Three months later, the lady fell on ice and she broke her hip. I didn't pray for that. But <coughs> she broke her hip. She went to hospital. She never healed. She died. Now, that week when she was in hospital, I went to visit her. My wife sent me, you go and visit her. I said, hey, she's not going to like me. Just go. Okay. I took some flowers from Aldi because that's cheap flowers. And I didn't consider that she's worthy to spend as I spent for my wife, you know. So I got there, 99 bouquet of three flowers, whatever. And I went to her. I said, hey, how are you doing? And she took the flowers with the left hand, the good hand, and she hit me in the head and broke the flowers on my head. She said, get out! I don't want to see you! In my mind, I don't want to see you either. So I left. I go home, and my wife says, what? How, how, how it worked? She broke the flowers on my head! I don't go back! And my wife said, no, you go back. I said, no, I don't go back. I said, no, you do go back. I said, honey, she doesn't want me. We got to respect people's choice. She said, no, if you love those who love you, you are just a pagan. If you love Christ, you love those who hate you. You go back. I said, honey, you don't know how hard it is. She said, well, that's the reason you are the pastor. <laughs> <laughs> so she cooked some Romanian cookies, take them, go back. I took the Romanian really good cookies to die for. And I went back, knocked in the door, opened the door, didn't go inside. And I said, hey, I got cookies for you. Don't trash them. If you don't eat them, I will. <laughs> I don't need your cookies. I don't want to see you. I hate you. Go away. But they smell nice. I said, yeah, sure they smell nice. My wife made them. Can I taste them? I said, they are for you. In five minutes, she tasted all of it. She ate everything. Well, now listen. After she ate, she asked me, why do you keep coming? Don't you know that I hate you? I said, well, I do know that. And to be honest, I don't like you either. But I got to visit you and to love you and to pray for you. And I am trying my best. And my wife sent me back. So that's what I am doing. And she said, there is no salvation for me. It's too late. The Holy Spirit left me long ago. Leave me alone. Let me die and be lost. All her life had elder. Lost in the church. Can you be in the church and be lost? Oh, yes. The coin was in the house and was lost and didn't even know that was lost. So I said, why would you say that? And she says... 70 years ago, I sinned against the Lord. I said, 70 years ago? That's it? You are holy. <laughs> Didn't you ask God for forgiveness? And she says, all my life. Then what's the problem? Oh, I'm not forgiven. What? Can it be that we ask God for forgiveness and we still live under the burden of the sin? Why? Is it because God doesn't forgive us? He says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes the sin of? How many? Everyone. Everyone. How many sins? Everyone. All of it. How big? Doesn't matter. I told him, I said, listen. Regardless how big your sin may be, if your sin is as big as Mount Everest, God's grace is as big as the whole universe. From the universe, you don't even see Mount Everest. It is so small. I said, what are you talking about? God's blood, Jesus' blood is sufficient. The Bible is plain. If we confess, God is faithful to forgive and to cleanse. Did you confess? Yes. Then what's the problem? Well, he didn't forgive me. How do you know? Well, I didn't feel it. I said, hello, forgiveness is not like electricity. You don't feel it. <laughs> oh, I am forgiven. It's forgiveness you don't feel. 
You don't see. You don't understand. You don't touch. You don't smell. That's science. Forgiveness is by faith. Faith is what you believe without seeing. Faith is the substance of unseen things. Substance comes from two words. Substanza. What stands under and keeps what is above. Faith is the foundation that stands under your life and keeps the whole Christian life. When you don't understand, faith keeps you stand. I said, it's faith that helps you believe that you are forgiven. You don't understand. You don't deserve. You cannot pay for it. I said, and how do I know when I'm forgiven? You don't need to. I said, you trust your car more than you trust God. I said, no, I trust God more than my car. I said, no, because when you put the key and turn it, you believe the car starts. When you say, forgive me, you don't believe God forgives. You still trust your car more than God. And she looked at me, you have a point. Sure, I'm the pastor. Kidding. <laughs> and I said, listen, when you say, Lord, please forgive me. In that moment, if you believe without understanding, without deserving, if you take God's word, you are done deal, past tense, forgiven. You follow me? When you say, Lord, this is not generic, forgive my sins, that's baloney. You got to be specific. Lord, this is what I did. Name it and say, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. In that moment, you are forgiven. Abraham believed God and it was considered to him in Hebrew. He was considered as righteous as God himself. Basically, Jesus takes those sins upon him and gives you his perfect, divine, perfect, clean righteousness. In that moment, you are like Christ. Can you grasp that? He says in, in, in Great Controversy, chapter 43 or 44 there, Ellen White says, we don't believe that we are forgiven, therefore we don't get forgiveness. And she says, when you believe, you are forgiven. And then she says, you should rejoice in it. Listen what she says. You should rejoice in it. Because this is big. You are as righteous as God. He takes all your sins like you never did anything. You are born new again. And he gives you his divine perfection. Isn't that enough reason to jump up and down and scream? Listen, my kid Ovi, the youngest one, when he was three years old, he noticed that I like motorcycles. Daddy, can I have your bike? I said, no. My bike is like this and you are like this. You cannot even get on my bike. Well, can I have a bike that is a little smaller? I said, no, Ovi. I can get you a Hot Wheels $1 bike like this. I said, no, Daddy, I cannot ride that bike. Get me a bike like this. I said, well, I'm going to get you like this. Oh, get me one like this. Okay. And you're negotiating until you got the deal in the middle. Okay, I'm going to get you a bike like this that has three wheels and pedals. Are you happy? He said, yeah, win. And I said, tomorrow when I come from work. Like crazy. When I said tomorrow, when I come from work, Ovi screamed and slammed through the door outside. And he said, hey, everybody, I got a bike. It is so big. It has three wheels and pedals. And they said, can we see it? Oh, my dad is going to buy it tomorrow. He was already rejoicing because he knew that I will do what I said. And next day I got him a bike. Listen, we go to God, but we don't trust him enough. When he says, when you confess, you are forgiven, to trust his word. You don't need to feel it. To just say, thank you, Lord. I am righteous. I am forgiven. I am cleansed. Can you imagine? I am new. I never sinned. And rejoice in it. And because we don't accept forgiveness and we don't rejoice, we remain in sin. So guess what we do? We sin again. But this is what Ellen White says in the next paragraph in great controversy she says after we rejoice we are not in sin therefore we can go on we can move on we get a new start remember about mary they drag her to jesus they want to kill her you remember and jesus writes on the sand. you remember nice on the sand so it could be erased okay and everybody leaves and jesus says where are your condemners? And she looks around and she says, nobody condemns me. And Jesus says, I do not condemn you either. He didn't come to condemn. He came to save. Therefore, what does he say? Nope. 
That's in Greek. That's in English. In Greek it says, there is a conjunction that is not translated. It is in the Webster Bible. It says, therefore you can go and see no more. So listen now. I do not condemn you. Therefore, you can go now and see no more. Because you are not condemned. If you accept the no condemnation gift, if you accept the forgiveness, then you can go and see no more. You are new. You have a new start. You follow now? It's like Paul. He says, I forget what is behind the same conjunction in Greek in order to run for the goal ahead. We are history teachers. We like to dwell in the past. Let past be past. Forget it. God forgave you. You got to forgive yourself too. Forget it and move on. You follow me? Don't put your eyes on sin. Put your eyes on Jesus. Do, do you? This is a big point. You got to accept forgiveness and you got to rejoice that you are forgiven and then you got to fix your eyes on Jesus. There are three steps. Number one, confess. Simple. Number two, believe. So you can actually benefit of the forgiveness on the cross. And number three, remain. John 15. And that's the next point in the Lord's Prayer. It says, and do not lead us into temptations. Bad translation. God doesn't lead anybody into temptation. Satan does. And sometimes we do a good job. Satan could take a vacation. God cannot be tempted to do evil because he is good. So I looked into the Greek. I had a problem with, please, Lord, don't lead me into temptation. Oh, I'm going to lead you. I got you. Oh, please don't. God doesn't do that. So I look into the Greek and it says, now you know that our translations come from Vulgata, the Catholic translation. And late, after the 60s, after they discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls, they went to the original and to the Septuaginta and they did the translation again. And you don't have to translate from the Catholic point of view. From the Catholic point of view, view, God is a tyrant and you need to please him and you need to pay for salvation. And, oh, please don't lead me into temptation. But they could be translated four ways. How many? Good, you listen. Number one, do not lead. Number two, do not let. Do not let me go into temptation. Number three, draw me close to you. And number four, that I love. And I think this is the right translation. The word in Greek could be translated, draw us close because alone we would slip into temptation. That's the way we are. If we are alone, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. John 15. Separated from me, you can do nothing. Basically, what it means, confess, believe, and remain. After God forgave you, after you accepted by faith, you stay with Christ because as long as you are with Christ, you are safe. As soon as you depart from Christ, you go back into temptation. You follow me? It's like my, when I, I like water. When I was a kid, my mom would put a little plastic tub that was like this shape, like an egg shape, into the front yard, and she would put bubble bath foam and I would take into the water. It was hot outside. And once in a while, I would get all under the water, cool down, and then get above the water again. And one time, I talked to my dad, and I said, hey, you pray all the time. If I see you at 11 p.m., you are praying. If I come home late and I see you at 2 a.m., you are praying. If I wake up early at 5 a.m., you are praying. I said, when do you sleep? And my father said, between prayers. <laughs> And then I said, why do you need so much prayer? And my father said, I don't need it. I love it. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, it's just that I don't want to be without God. I want to spend time with him. And I said, how do you explain to be with God all the time, to spend time? And my father said, do you know when you go under the water? The water is above, it's under, left, right, front, behind. It's all over you. That's to be surrounded by God's presence, my father said. You move into God's presence. You swim in God's presence. You are covered by God's presence. And my father said, then you are safe. And my father looked to me and said, you should not leave your room before you pray. You are not safe to go without God. You follow me? When you are forgiven, the next thing you do, 
you make sure you don't say oh give me victory over this sin give me victory so you focus on sin you say lord remain with me today don't let me if i forget remind me don't let me depart that's the reason daniel would pray three times a day he would not let himself depart he would not let himself forget you follow me well i think we are getting ready to finish the lord's prayer that's good <clears throat> Okay, let's take a look quick here. Uh huh. So, <clears throat> do you? I'm not going to move into the next subject. We'll do tomorrow. We have ten more minutes. Do you have questions? Feel free to ask any question. If I don't know, I tell you I don't know. If I don't like, I don't answer. If you don't like, don't call me back. It's okay either way. Feel free to ask. Oh, thank you. Thank you. The story of the lady. So she said, I appreciate it. She said, so you say that I don't need to do anything. It's just that I have to believe. I said, yeah. And she said, how do you believe? I said, simple, like a kid, you say, I'm forgiven. And then you start jumping up and down, screaming and dancing and whistling, and you say, I'm forgiven. I said, well, it's going to be hard for me to jump. <laughs> and she said, so that's it, just believe. I said, yep. And she said, would you pray with me? I said, absolutely. And she prayed and she said, Lord, I already asked you for forgiveness all my life. I choose to believe. I don't get it how, but I believe. You cannot understand how God works unless you are God. That's a little bigger than our brains, don't you think so? Don't try to understand and to explain God. Come on. If you don't understand, then you don't believe. That's not faith. So she said, Lord, I don't get it how it works, but I choose to believe. I said, yeah. And then I pray, Lord, I know she is forgiven. Pray positive. Lord, I know you paid on the cross. And she struggles to believe, but she doesn't need a lot of faith. She just needs a master seed. And she chose the master seed right now. So she is forgiven, Lord. Thank you. And I said, Lord, thank you so much. You gave her another chance. And I said, Amen. And she was crying. And she looked at me and she says, and that's it. I am forgiven. I said, you are forgiven. And you sure? I said, hey, it's God's word. It's not mine. You confess? God is faithful. It's a covenant. You do your part. Why do you think God is not going to do his part? I said, that's it. After 72 years of living with that sin in my mind, I am clean again. I said, yes, you are. And she said, sit down. And she took the telephone and she started to call members. Hey, you better obey this pastor. If not, I don't give you any money. You better. And I said, calm down. Don't do that again. But hey, she was 92. I could not expect her to change. But anyway. She started to call them, you better obey this pastor. I stayed nine years in that district. By God's grace, the church grew and grew and grew. And it was nothing that I did. It was the fact that people started to grasp who God is. Because if you understand God, that's life. It's not what you do. It's who you know. So, she died about a week or two later. But I choose to believe that she'll be saved. I don't know. God knows. And I am glad he knows because if it was for me, many will not be saved. But God is gracious. <laughs> okay. I told you what happened to the lady. Questions? Yes. We have a hand there in that corner if you have a mic. Hold on a second. Just wait for the mic. Uh, oh, goodness. <laughs> Could I just make a comment about forgiveness? I went for years without being able to forgive myself for th things that happened to me in the past. And I, because, as you said, I couldn't feel forgiven. But then I realised if I, f if I do not forgive myself, I'm placing myself above the God of the universe who has already forgiven me. So I'm in Satan's territory. So I had to forgive myself under those circumstances. Amen. We sometimes think that we are better than God. He can forgive, we cannot. And I tell you, listen carefully, folks. People that don't experience forgiveness are those who never forgive. Because you cannot give what you don't have. The more you walk 
among flowers, the more you smell like flowers. Let me translate it for you. The more you walk in grace and forgiveness, the more you share grace and forgiveness. People who know God, they don't have a problem to forgive because they have been forgiven. Any other question? And everybody said, me, 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 me. No? Okay, one hand right here. Um, somebody mentioned intercessory prayer, and I'm just curious if we have a loved one that we're praying for their salvation, um, what should we include? Because as, as an Adventist growing up, you know, you hear the story about Hezekiah, and he, you know, he prayed the wrong, he prayed so, a prayer, and it, it ended up all bad, and, and we get told we're not supposed to pray this way, and we're not supposed to do that, and we're not supposed to limit God. What exactly so, can perhaps, we pray? I don't want you to be scared of, what if I don't pray right? Listen, this is a structure to help you understand more about God. But however you pray, pray. That's the key, pray. Now, talking about intercessory prayer, I want you to know that Friday morning, 11 o'clock, I will speak just about intercessory prayer. And I will go one hour deep into intercessory prayer. For now, just a quick answer. Just a quick answer. Do never, do, you never stop praying for somebody as long as you live. For instance, there was a church member, Joe, in my uh, Wisconsin district. And she came to me and she said, Pastor, I've been praying for my son 40 years and God didn't answer. I said, no, Joe. God answered every day to every prayer. You just need to keep praying because God cannot force people. And when you pray, if they say no, but you pray for them, God says, I have to answer because my servant is praying for that person, so I have to work. It gives God right to work when he has no right because those people reject God. So basically I told her, keep praying. And she did. And she died. She never saw him turning around. At funeral, he came, and after listening to the sermon, he came to me crying and said, I want to see mom again. I want you to give him a Bible studies. I gave him Bible studies, baptized him. He started a church. He's the head elder in that church. He's doing great. When Jesus comes, they both will have a surprise. She will say, you stinker here? And you may say the same about her, you know, whatever. But, <laughs> uh, so, but Friday morning. Okay, there is another hand there. Yesterday you mentioned um, how you were praying and God was like speaking to you and like you're hearing God's voice. Um, I'm just wondering like is that, do you believe that that experience is available to everyone or is that an experience which is like I want you like a gift of prophecy or something where God would no, speak no, no, to no, the no, prophet? No, 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 don't, don't go there. God doesn't say my prophet will hear my voice. He says my sheep. God wants to have a relationship with everyone and to communicate. And God says to everyone, I know the plans I have for you. And it's not singular. The plan, referring to the plan of salvation, is plural and it refers in Hebrew grammar to daily plans. Basically, God wants you daily to go before him and see if he has something for you. Now, listen carefully. I don't want you to go in extremes of don't listen to God's voice or, oh, God got to talk to me all the time. Many people go in extremes. Some of them talk about spiritual formation, meditation, Bologna, Asian influence kind of, uh, uh, how you say, those religions, oriental religions that you have a middle eye. I don't have a middle eye. I just have two. And you focus on that middle eye. And if you think about nothing, I cannot. As long as I am alive, my brain goes in a thousand directions all the time. If you think about nothing, then you can focus and whatever, crazy baloney. The Bible talks about meditation, but the word has been hijacked. The Bible every time, how many times? The Bible and the Spirit, I have here in my folder over two pages of Bible verses on meditation and over four pages of quotations from the Spirit of Prophecy on meditation. All of them, every single time, it gives you the object of your meditation. 
Day and night I meditate upon your law. I meditate upon your word. Ellen White says, contemplate, meditate on his cross, the last week of his life, his sacrifice. Basically, you don't focus on nothing. You focus on God. You follow me? You don't empty your brain. You fill your brain with Jesus. You follow me? And then, when you do that, God may choose to talk, or he may choose not to talk, because he's the master. He talks whenever he wants. But if you don't listen, you'll not hear. But if you keep connected all the time, when God tells you something, you'll know. Think about Samuel. God said, Samuel, and he runs to Eli. God didn't get angry. Oh, he don't know my voice. I'm not talking to you again. If you are honest, God will keep talking to you until you learn his voice. But folks, some people expect to distinguish God's voice without spending time with God. You cannot know somebody before you spend time with that somebody. Pray enough to get to the point that you get used to distinguish that voice between a thousand voices in your brain. You follow me? So yes, sometimes he doesn't talk. He talks when there is a need. But if there is a need, he will, if you listen. Okay, other questions? Yes, we have one more here. And that's the last one. Our time is up. I need to eat. <laughs> yes? Uh, Pavel, earlier in the uh, week you talked about the fact that once you've asked God something, uh, don't keep persisting and persisting and keep asking, asking, asking. But then at the same time you talked about uh, praying all night and then maybe praying two nights in a row for a particular uh, issue. Um, I'm just wondering if you could explain the pot potential conf um, conflict between those two things. That's a good question. How do you reconcile, don't keep pushing God, with pray the whole night? Listen, folks, I don't pretend I have the answers, but I did study a lot on prayer, and this is my understanding, and if it doesn't match your need, just pray the way you pray, but this is what I think, okay? If we say, may your will be done, we need to leave room for that will to happen. You follow me? Because we may pray for something that God may have a different plan and we don't see it right now. And we need to accept God's will. Therefore, we should not push God. But when he says pray without ceasing, it doesn't refer to ask, but it refers to connection. Have a relationship with God. Therefore, prayer is not to resolve problems, but to know Christ. The function of prayer is relationship. You follow me? And the goal of prayer is to walk with God, to get to the point that we can walk with him 24-7, as people in the Bible did. That's the goal of prayer. Therefore, when you pray more, you get to know him. And if you get to know him enough, you trust him. And when you trust him, you don't need to push him. You present the need and you have peace. You follow me? If you pray more, you know him. If you know him, you trust him. If you trust him, you have peace. You say, this is the problem. And then you say, I choose to trust you. You give it to him and you know you can trust him more than you can trust self. Sometimes we trust self more than God. We don't feel good before you do something about it and we make a mess. However, there is something different there. And now I get to your question. It depends on the situations. Sometimes God says no, and we might, must accept it. But sometimes God says yes, but in a different way or in a different time. For instance, I liked my wife. I wanted to marry her. But it didn't work. And I prayed, and I prayed, and nothing worked. And eventually, I was willing to give her up. And I said, Lord, I love her, but if you say no, I will accept it. And just when I said, I am willing to accept your will, just then it worked out. It's like when Abraham was willing to lose his son, he finally got his son. Many times, God would not give us something before we put God above that something. Because whatever comes between you and God, that's your God. And you need to be willing to lose it in order to get it. And you should not lose it to get it. You should lose it, period. You follow me? Or God may say, yes, but not now. And you don't need to understand. You just accept it by faith. Trust him. 
because there is a quotation in the spirit of prophecy that says, to every, how many? To every honest prayer, an answer will come. I am willing to give you my materials. I have all these quotations in very organized order. You go to alphabetical order and you go to F, forgiveness. You go to I, intercession. You go to whatever subject you choose and you find the paragraphs of prayer related to the subject. Not all, because there are over 5,000 paragraphs, but I picked two for each subject that are the most meaningful. So, she says, an answer to every honest prayer, to every honest prayer, an answer will come. But then she says, it would be wrong to assume that God would answer the way we want in the time we want. And then she says, if we knew the end from the beginning, we would choose just the same. You know that paragraph, don't you? So basically, what I do, I present my need. And because God may say no, he may say yes, he may say not this way or not now, I may need to understand if he wants me to do something about it. Or this may be a small problem. Should I be in vacation here or there? Or maybe a big problem. Should I go and get this job or that job? That's a little more important. You follow me? Oh, young lady, you are so beautiful. There are seven guys that want to marry you, just marry anyone. Uh -uh, that's an important prayer. Don't you think so? Therefore, if it's a bigger prayer, you see in the Bible, people pick a time frame to pray for something. Moses, 40 days. Disciples, 10 days in the upper room. You remember? You watch in the Bible, most of the times there is a time frame involved. You choose a time and you say, I'm going to pray a week, and then I, I leave it alone. I move on. Let God be God. You follow me now? For instance, I give you a story, and this is it. Last question. We were in Norway. My wife and I went to school there. We spent one year learning about organic agriculture and natural, healthy lifestyle. When we went there, they told us, that they could not give us the visa for the kids right away because we applied too late. But they should go next week. So, okay, we can wait a week. We left because school started, and then the kids went next week to the Norwegian embassy, and they got rejected. And the kids were, if I remember right, about five and eight years old. And Anna, more, less, somewhere there. Maybe four, five, and seven, eight, nine years old, somewhere there. How long could those kids stay without the parents? Not too long. And we could not stay without them either. So, we prayed, Lord, help the kids come. Nothing happened. And we prayed again, nothing happened. And there was Pastor Gary Williams from Georgia Cumberland Conference who spoke for camp meeting. And he said, when you pray... Have a time frame, and after that, leave it alone. God may not want that. And you may need to change your plans instead of God changing his plans. And we said, well, that's a good thought. So Dana and I talked about it, and we decided this is an important subject, and we prayed 30 days. And we said, Lord, if you want us to be in school in Norway, you bring the kids in 30 days. If not, we may not be here. Not your will. We came here because we want it, not because you want it. Then we go back home. And we made a covenant with the Lord. And then I went to do my job to the passport service. And I talked to the chief of the immigration service. And I said, let them come. Give them visa. And he said, nope. Not going to happen. I said, why? We need to keep them in Romania to make sure that you go back in Romania. I said, I have no interest to stay here. We have a good job, we have a good business, we have money, and we did. I know we came to school. Why would you keep us separated from our kids? He said, well, you don't have to be in school. If you don't like it, go back. Very rude. So I went back to him. I said, come on. How long would you stay without your kids? He said, well, they should go the proper route. When you got rejected, by law, you need to wait six months, and then you can apply again. What? Six months, give me a break. 
So, well, that's the law, and I'm not about to break the law for you. That's the law. You cannot apply. Your application will be rejected unless you wait six months. Well, I went back to the school and talked to the school principal, and I said, we leave. However, we made a covenant with God. We'll pray 30 days, and then we leave. So he called the passport service, and the guy said, no, law is law. Six months, and they apply again, and they may be accepted or rejected. We said, no, 30 days. In the 30th day, it, is, it was, if I remember properly, mealtime, evening, it was 7 o'clock. I said, 7 o'clock, 30th day, we get in the car and leave. A covenant is a covenant. I'm not about to break it. So, we prayed with the other classmates, and we put it before the Lord. And we said, Lord, you know the situation. We'll keep it in prayer 30 days, and then if you say no, we give up school and go back. Nothing happened. In the 30th day, 15 to 7, I hate when he does that. God answers always in the last moment, not in the last day, in the last second. He's never early, he's never late either. So, 15 to 7, we got a phone call, go and pick them up from airport, from Oslo. And we said, how in the world? It's not six months. So they told us the story. This is what happened. They had a conference on immigration issues because there were many Arabs immigrating to Norway. When they met the chief of the passport with the prime minister, with the congress, with the king, everybody, they talked. And then they had meal. At the meal time, the guy from the passport service says, and these people never get it. Like that Romanian family, young family, they say, hey, if you don't bring our kids, we give up school. Why would I care? Let them give up school. Let them go back home. And the prime minister that was at the same table said, we do care for families and for education. We want families together. We want people educated. We do care. And he said, well, the law is the law. And the prime minister, unless the king would sign different, said, well, the king is not going to sign different. And the prime minister stood up, went to the king, and said to the king of Norway, this is the situation, this is the family, and this is what they do. They are going to give up school. And the king wrote a paper and signed it. And he gave it to the chief of passport. The chief of passport called the Norwegian embassy in Bucharest. They called our parents in law. And they said, get the kids to the embassy today. They said, the kids are in school. They come at 3 p.m. At 3 p.m. the embassy was closed. What they did, they took the kids and they took the ambassador from home, brought him back to the embassy, opened the embassy, gave them visa, got a plane ticket, got on the plane. 15 to 7, they called us to the airport, picked them up. So basically, if God wants something to happen, he doesn't need my help. Really. If God doesn't want, then you need to think, to think second time if you want it. You follow me? But we should put a time frame, and it depends on the problem. After that, we need to move on and let God be God. So I cannot give you a very precise answer, but I tell you, the more time we spend with God, the more peace we have to trust in him when we don't understand, and he's going to pay off. Okay, this is it. Let's have a prayer, and then we go to it. Father in heaven, Thank you for trying to have a relationship with us. And we do want to have a relationship with you too. That's the reason we are here, Father. Teach us how to pray and help us actually pray. Help us not just to talk about prayer, but to spend time with you, Father. To be thirsty for you. To get to know you. To get to experience you daily. To get to trust you and have peace. In Jesus' precious name we pray and thank you. Amen.